Welcome everyone to this great panel. My name is Stephen Owens and I'm a senior policy analyst over K-12 public education here at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. We have a panel today um, titled K-12 in COVID, how to overcome cuts and envision an equitable future. I'm excited about our two guests and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and their work. First, Dr. Mary McKillop. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a senior researcher at the Education Law Center. We are based in Newark, New Jersey. The Education Law Center is a, a legal and, and policy advocacy group that's been around since 1973. Its main work uh, initially was focused on New Jersey, but we've expanded. My work is mainly research focused on specific states, including Georgia, looking at how money gets distributed out to schools and what resources that money is targeted towards to support student learning. Thank you so much. And now Dr. Morsi Beasley. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Morcise Beasley. I serve as the superintendent of schools in Clayton County, south of Atlanta. When you land in Atlanta, you land in Clayton County. We're excited to be here to share the work that we're doing, even as we're in the middle of building our fiscal year 2022 budget. Thank you, Stephen, for this opportunity. Oh, I'm glad to have you both. And I Full disclosure, I've worked uh, with both of these excellent folks in the past um, and really appreciate what y'all are doing. Um, we have three presentations about education funding here in Georgia um, from the state, uh, national, and then the local levels. And I'm gonna go first with a quick presentation uh, focusing on the persistent cuts to schools. If you were able to uh, being at the panel on last Friday for our conference, then you saw that I gave an update of the governor's proposed budget. But now as we look specifically at what these cuts have looked like, we have a better sense of what our schools are going through. Um, over the last 19 years, the state of Georgia has fully funded public schools twice. If the governor's budget is approved, then that means every 20 years, only two of those years have been fully funded. So this would be a much smaller cut than what happened at the beginning of the fiscal year, um, but would push them forward into 2022. And so this is what this looks like in $10 billion in cuts over 20 years. It's important to note however, that not all schools in Georgia are getting a budget cut. Um, as the state has eroded support in their commitment to public schools with these draconian cuts year over year, during the recession, the state started what's called voucher programs, which is funding using uh, public dollars that then go to private schools. And I remember a lot of the debate at the time was uh, that, uh, as public education advocates were saying that this would erode support, those in favor of the voucher say, no, 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 this is just additional money, but it's hard not to see these two things connected, that as millions, hundreds of millions of dollars have gone to private schools, the amount of funding going to public schools gets eaten away every single year. And currently the state legislature has three bills that would increase more public funding to go to private schools while our schools are dealing with 20 years worth of cuts to provide a public education. These cuts are not without consequences. We provided a survey over the summer um, where we asked school district leaders how they would handle the previous cuts in education funding over the summer, especially in regards to the costs associated to the pandemic. I found the vast majority are going to use local budget reserves, which are fund balances that have been built up over the last few years. But even still, we found that 13 districts representing 250,000 students were going to use every single dollar of their reserves in this year alone. Half the districts surveyed said that they would have to reduce spending on professional development. Remember that this is why a lot of school districts are learning new ways to provide instruction 
online and support for the pedagogical challenges is absolutely needed. 13% of school districts said they would be implement teacher furlough days. We heard more over the fall of how many school districts that had to shorten instructional days, not renew contracts or furlough teachers in order to make these cuts, uh, in order to make their budgets a reality. And it goes deeper than that. Um, we provided a report over the fall about the English for Speakers of Other Languages program. So this is for students who are learning English. It's funding provided in um, the state law for these students. And we found that while there are about 3,200 positions available in one year that were allotted in the program, only 2,700, under 2,800 were actually employed across the state. After having discussions with local school districts, it was clear this is due to uh, vast flexibility on how to use state funding, which has been true in Georgia for several years, um, but also having conversations and just realizing that this is what happens when we underfund schools for several years. That if you have more needs than the money uh, to meet those needs, then you have to pull funding from somewhere. We have underfunded school transportation. We've underfunded grants for low wealth school districts. And in order to make ends meet, you're going to have to pull funding for, those, for any emergencies that come up from somewhere. And so it's going to come from direct instructional costs that we've seen. The cuts that these school districts have gone through are not equitable across the state. Um, a report from two years ago, we showed that there is a huge difference in the opportunities provided to school districts in the Black Belt, which is this band of counties that you can see that is uh, majority students of color, uh, majority low income students, they are much less likely to have access to AP tests. Uh, they're less likely uh, for students to be eligible for the HOPE scholarship. Um, and similarly, we saw that during uh, the beginnings of the pandemic, when a lot of schools moved to online instruction, that these rural Black Belt districts have much less access to high-speed internet. So there is a different educational system happening in these rural, smaller districts with more people of color and with more students living in poverty than what's happening in the rest of the state. And that is a, that's a problem for several reasons, but from the state position of this constitutional requirement to provide an adequate public education, it shows that that mandate is not happening equally across the state. So how do we break out of the cycle? Um, we asked school leaders that if given the, cho the choice between continuing budget cuts or common sense uh, revenue raisers, like increasing the tobacco tax, overwhelmingly school leaders said that they would rather raise revenues. And these are bipartisan ideas, considering the fact that when you just look at the tobacco tax on its own, um, we have one of the lowest in the nation, and if we were able to raise that to the national average, it would be $700 million that we could use to increase services that the state of Georgia relies upon. So that is just a quick summary of what these cuts have looked like over the past few years. I'm now going to pass it over to Dr. McKillop to show you what this looks like uh, on a grander scale and nationally. Thanks, Stephen. Let me share screen here. Can you see that? We can. Okay. So um, the Education Law Center recently released a national report called $600 billion lost. Um, and it finds that in the decade through and following the Great Recession from 2008 to 2018, Georgia's gross domestic product increased by 18%, while state and local pre-K through 12 revenues decreased by 3%. So in other words, as Georgia recovered and strengthened its economic foothold after the Great Recession, the state actually put less 
effort into funding its students in its public pre-K through 12 education system. This educational disinvestment occurred to some extent in most states throughout the country, but Georgia's drop in effort was actually the fifth largest in the nation. So this means that on the cusp of the COVID-19 pandemic, Georgia school districts were funded below 2008 pre-recession levels. You'll see that the chart at the bottom looks very similar to what Stephen shared earlier with the cuts. So if, if Georgia had just maintained the effort put towards public school funding in 2008 over the decade, the state would have put 35.6 billion more dollars into their schools. So looking at this information, comparing Georgia to a few neighboring states, uh, Georgia's in the orange, South Carolina in the gray, Tennessee in the yellow, and Florida in the blue. And these are states that I pulled out, they're neighboring states that experienced a similar economic recovery since the recession. So they all range from a 14 to 19% GDP increase. So all the states saw their effort decline, but South Carolina and Tennessee's reductions were average drops. And you can see that South Carolina started from a much higher effort level in funding their public schools. And so they have continued to put a strong effort into their schools. Um, while Florida and Georgia were among the largest drops in the country, leading to massive loss of revenue in those states. You'll see also um, in tandem with the $600 billion loss report put out their annual making the grade report, which looks at school funding, um, comparing states. And in this, based on 2018 revenue, um, Georgia ranked 37 out of 51. That includes the District of Columbia. That's why it's not 50. Um, 37 out of 51 on funding level with about $12,000 per pupil and state and local dollars, uh, over $2,000 below the national average, average of per pupil funding. Also in the making the grade report, um, we find that despite the fact that research clearly demonstrates that students in poverty need more school resources available to them, districts in Georgia are flat funded such that high poverty districts receive about the same amount of funding per pupil as low poverty districts. So then to top this all off, as, as, as we know, in June 2020, the Georgia General Assembly approved a 10% cut in state aid to school districts. The cut is distributed pretty evenly across districts, about $500 per pupil on average. Now, federal emergency funds have come and more are coming and those will certainly help to offset some of these cuts, but those funds, just like during the Great Recession, are only temporary. So if the state funding doesn't jump back up afterwards, the, the issues from the Great Recession with all the state aid cuts will, will be repeated. So key takeaways here. Um, as Georgia moves through this COVID pandemic, additional cuts to school funding should be avoided at all costs, especially in the higher poverty districts. Schools truly need more resources right now, not just PPE and extra cleaning supplies, but other key resources such as sufficient nurses and school counselors to help students navigating the, the physical and mental health issues coming out of this pandemic. Um, and then as the economy recovers, Georgia really must avoid the approach taken after the Great Recession, as seen here. Um, the, the state can and should increase efforts to fund public schools, and extra resources are needed in the higher poverty districts, which can be addressed by revising the state's funding formula. So as, as seen here, Georgia absolutely can afford to do more and tax policies are needed to generate additional revenue to support increased effort towards funding public education.
Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to hand it over to Dr. Beasley, who's going to show us what this looks like at the individual school level. You are muted, Dr. Beasley. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Looks like we can, yes. All right. Well, again, thank you for this opportunity. And I'd like to basically share the, the local impact to the budget cuts. I'd like to look at how the budget cuts really affect our schools, the students that are most impacted by the lower funding, and what additional funding could do for our students, families, and communities, uh, not only in Clayton, but clearly throughout the state, as Stephen highlighted what's happening around the state, especially in the Black Belt counties. I'd like you to take a look, if you will, at this, this chart that shows you the revenue that we have in Clayton County versus the expenditures uh, for fiscal year 21. Clearly, that was impacted by the state's decision to reduce educational funding. When the state makes a decision to reduce funding at the state level, then that requires districts to basically have to go into their savings account or their fund balance, if you will. It helps if you have a fund balance, but clearly you can't continue to go into your fund balance year after year if you're not replenishing your fund balance. So we find ourselves in a situation where we're using the fund balance, but we're not replenishing the fund balance, which requires us to make some very, very drastic cuts. But I'd like to also, for you to also notice that 30% of our revenue are, 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 are local, from local property taxes. Clayton County is in the Metro Atlanta area, but our property values are uh, assessed at a far uh, lower rate than some of our neighboring counties, including Fulton, Atlanta, DeKalb, and others. So imagine uh, the, the urban or the, the rural school districts that are relying on their property taxes if they're only funded at 70% statewide. You could imagine that the reduction in funding really, really aggravates the local situation. While we acknowledge that we receive uh, the first installment of, of CARES funding, uh, we should also state that it was less than 2% of the total public education funding for the fiscal year. So very helpful funds, but by no means, by no means will those funds fill the total gaps. But very quickly, I'd like to show you the impact of the budget cuts given the state reduced revenue about 10%. Of course, we have to figure out ways to decrease our operating expenditures. Uh, we're virtual in Clayton County and we have been this year and which has helped us in the area of utilities by reducing those costs by approximately 30%. But we also find ourselves hiring less teachers because about 90% of our, our budget goes into personnel costs for salaries and benefits. Uh, of course, we could not provide a cost of living increase for our educators. While we have not considered, uh, we have not implemented furlough days, it is a consideration on the table. We're, again, I've already shared, we're forced to spend part of our fund balance and we hope that we can come out of fund balance spending so we can start saving again. And of course, it exacerbates the gaps that we already had and we continue to see. Those cuts contribute to increased learning loss and they also divide and or uh, widen, if you will, the digital divide. Now we have addressed that in Clayton County, but just imagine the challenges throughout the state, uh, especially in our more rural counties. We have had to use our federal funding to help us uh, address the virtual learning situation by purchasing laptops, providing internet for our families using the support of our foundation here in Clayton County implementing a learning management system, of course, professional learning, and then of course, social emotional learning. Who are the students that are impacted by this lower funding? Clearly low income students, low wealth districts, not only in, in, in Clayton County, but around the state. In particular, homeless students, foster care youth, and those who are economically disadvantaged. As you heard Stephen mention in the black belt areas, a lot of uh, ethnic minorities, uh, migrant students, our early learners are impacted, uh, and our students with disabilities, and our English learners are also impacted. And of course, 
we should highlight students who have food insecurities are also impacted. But you should note that some of our more uh, advanced learners are impacted as well. They don't have as many opportunities for dual enrollment, advanced placement, as you saw on the, the slides that Stephen shared. And then it also impacts our efforts to accelerate and provide students access to AP coursework. And then, especially during the pandemic, work-based learning and apprenticeship programs are impacted. Uh, and clearly our early learners with the number of seats uh, reduced because of the reduction in revenue, which impacts the preparation that we would love to see for our students who are getting ready for kindergarten. In summary, our economically disadvantaged students are most impacted when we have to deal with revenue reductions. And in closing, I'd like to share what additional funding could do for not just our students and families, but the entire community because it impacts the entire community. We could, if we had more funding, we could have more counselors as you've already heard. We could provide more student and families mental health and wellness support. And we could provide more thera therapeutic support for our students who are impacted by trauma, whether it be the trauma of the pandemic, the trauma of poverty or other uh, types of trauma. We'd like to, of course, secure more behavior interventionists. And we would love, we would love to ensure that our students have access, have access to healthcare opportunities. Of course, giving our students access to higher levels of rigor and in the curriculum would be a priority and would be beneficial. And then a, providing the professional, professional learning that our teachers need to not only teach face-to-face, -face, but in a virtual environment or a hybrid environment, an environment where we're doing both face-to-face -face and uh, virtual learning. And then of course, expanding access to pre-K. And I should state that in Clayton County, we serve about 25% of our pre-K eligible kids in the county in our pre-K program. Another 25% attend private providers. So basically 50% of our pre-K eligible students in Clayton County are not in an early learning program. And we would love to address that. And of course, summer learning, extended learning opportunities could be afforded and after school services, as many of our caregivers often express, are very helpful, could also be afforded. Needless to say, the tools for learning could be secured and sustained, which is very important. In particular, now that we're virtual, 24, uh, 24 hour, seven day a week tutorial access, very important. And of course, continuing to expand the, the virtual tools that students need, mentoring, and access to work-based learning, internships, apprenticeships, et cetera. Uh, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how locally, not just in Clayton County, but around the state locally, districts are being impacted by the loss or the reduction of revenue and those who are primarily impacted and how that impact is playing out within our various communities and school districts. Thank you, Stephen. I'll pitch it back over to you. Thank y'all so much. So we have, I've got a couple questions uh, for y'all and uh, also audience members, if y'all have any questions, I've already seen some in the Q&A, you can uh, continue to add to that. Um, but I'm gonna kick it off with a question to Dr. McKillop. Um, you're saying that it looks like the, the funding is pretty flat here in Georgia, that we provide the same amount of funding for high poverty districts and low poverty districts generally. Um, your shop was instrumental in introducing the idea of an opportunity weight here in Georgia uh, it, to me and we've been able to kind of continue to build that out. Um, I have two questions. One, can you explain what an opportunity weight would be? And then why do we need it if it looks like we're having about equal funding for districts here in Georgia? Sure. So the opportunity weight um, is a weight that would be folded into a school funding formula in Georgia and would, um, as like a, the formula is student-based. So students with additional needs 
students in poverty, you could have a weight for English language learners, students with disabilities, those students would generate additional funding that would go to the school district to support um, their learning above and beyond the base amount of funding that would go to each student. Um, and the reason why for something like that is I'm sure most folks have heard the argument that equal does not necessarily mean equitable. And that definitely applies here when we're talking about school funding for students in poverty. What we know is that money and the social environment that comes with money gets students, children, opportunities starting from the day they're born. So by the time school starts, students in poverty often come in already less prepared than their wealthier peers. Um, for example, what Dr. Beasley just mentioned about preschool and preschool access, if you can afford a private preschool, if, you're, if the public option is not available, that is one thing that is extremely important um, for students to have access to. Um, students who are coming from families that are struggling financially are often living in communities that are quite poor. So there's a community resource gap as well. And so without additional funding going to schools to support their students in poverty, the schools can't possibly address the achievement gap and it will and does continue to, go, to grow. Um, and one other piece of this is this uh, argument that money matters for schools and there's a lot of great research that has come out in recent years showing that increased school funding targeted towards lower income students has a real strong positive impact on educational and life outcomes of those students beyond school. Um, we have a review of, the, of that research on our, um, on the ELC's website. There is a link to it. I know that the presentations will be shared afterwards and I do have a link to that piece in um, in my presentation. So an opportunity weighed in Georgia's funding formula that gives districts more funding to support students in poverty would go really far to make school funding more equitable in the, in the state, especially given what Dr. Beasley just mentioned about all of the impacts of COVID that are making these achievement gaps even more, they're, they're worsening things with the digital divide and all of the issues coming through COVID. Stephen, yeah, we're, if I may, yeah, go Stephen, ahead. If I may add to what Mary shared, I think sometimes people don't realize that while the state funding is funding is flat, each district is also depending on its local property value tax values, which you all know varies depending on where you are, who you are, household income, etc. So those who have get more; those who don't have get less which also aggravates the local uh, funding situation, which impacts the quality and the amount of services that districts can provide. Therefore, districts that get more funding provide more services, better services, and districts with less funding or not as much funding, they have to slash services. That impacts and aggravates the achievement gap as well. Absolutely. I, I'm happy to say that we, we now have a bill that a representative Scott has uh, pre-filed. It's HB 10, and it would provide about $343 million more for students living in poverty. Um, and so that would go a long way if passed and appropriated to address the differences and opportunities um, that Dr. Beasley mentioned and that Dr. McKillop um, show just kind of like how um, how desperately is needed here in Georgia. Um, Dr. Beasley, I've got a question for you. Um, and it was actually right in line with one that was put in the chat. And so I'm just going to ask the one from the chat. So let's say we're going to imagine, reimagine K-12 funding and expenses. So from a zero budget standpoint, the idea that just like you have to throw everything away, start from scratch of the funds you need and um, and where it would go. Do you think we would come about to the same level or are there areas that you can imagine needing a little bit less or are there areas that you think 
need to be addressed further? Just kind of as you think about that, because you're the only one of us that's actually budgeted for schools. Uh, what do you think that would look like if we really just kind of threw out everything and started over? I, I really think at first, it's a great question. I, I do think that we will find ourselves in a situation where we actually need to increase the revenues because most of our expenditures are in personnel and benefits. And as you well know, if you don't know, you should know, those costs continue to eat up our budgets. Every year we're increasing uh, salaries when we can and the benefit costs, retirement costs, et cetera, health insurance, those costs continue to climb. But I should I should share that if we could reimagine, I would love I as a and I've thought about this. I would love to see an equity equity tax on corporations, and that equity tax would go to our lower uh, funded or lower um, ec economic situation school districts. You know, oftentimes we hear businesses and and corporations say they need a better quality or product in in of the employees that they hire. Well, I think they need to invest in that. And it would be helpful if we could eliminate the gaps that exist. Most of our students in the state of Georgia come from low income uh, environments. I have to say that again, most of our students in the state of Georgia come from low income environments. So if we don't find a way to get to equity in our funding, all we will continue to do is have these conversations and perpetuate the inequities and the achievement gaps. And we'll be having this conversation a decade from now, two decades from now, three decades from now. So we've got to figure out a way. And I know, you know, people don't want to overtax, but I believe if you want to get the product, the quality of the, the workforce where it should be, you have to acknowledge that we have some very uh, distinct differences right now that we need to address and funding provides us the opportunity to address those concerns. Yeah, well said. I, I think it's important to recognize in Arizona recently, they just put a tax on the ballot and asked the average voter, would you be willing to increase taxes on the wealthiest Arizonans in order for that funding to go to schools? And it, and it passed overwhelmingly. Wow. But this is, yeah, this is not, um, some partisan issue. This is something the average uh, voter recognizes a need for in their community. Uh, one of the questions, uh, seemingly innocuous, but I'd love to talk, sorry, I don't know when that muted, seemingly innocuous question about the state ranking in education and our, and our academic achievement. Um, one of the things I find fascinating is that wherever you see Georgia kind of in those outcome rankings compared to other states and depending on who's ranking, it could be very middle of the road, could be a little bit higher than that nationally. One of the things that we are the worst in the nation on is the difference of how our low income students perform versus our high income students. And so I'll say that again, if Georgia were to be able to fund and do right by our low income students in the state, we would have one of the highest performing educational systems in the nation. And I know that Dr. Beasley, you wanted to say a little bit more about like uh, that question. I don't know if you had any more to add on to that. Well, I, I have to agree with that wholeheartedly, Stephen. Just imagine, uh, you, you mentioned in your graph you, that a lot of our students don't even have access to advanced placement courses in certain communities in certain rural counties. That creates, uh, that contributes to the inequities, the gaps that we see. So just imagine, imagine, envision a state wherein every student in the state has access to highly paid, highly qualified teachers, rigorous curriculum opportunities, course opportunities, and the support that they need in order to do well in those various opportunities we will eliminate the achievement gap and I would say within a very short period of time relatively. It's important that we understand that sometimes in the metro Atlanta area, you know, even the, the access that our students have or has, we take for granted that a lot of students in our state don't have access the way we pay our teachers, we take for granted that outside of the metro area, that many of those 
teachers, same teachers providing the same services are not paid at the same level as they are in the metro area. It, it just imagine, envision a state where no matter where you taught or where you chose to teach, you were paid, highly paid, and the salary was consistent. That alone, that alone would help us with teacher retention, not only in the urban areas, but in the rural areas, that alone would help us, I believe, close some amount of the achievement gap. It really just goes back to funding and our commitment to identifying the inequities and addressing those inequities. And I strongly believe, and I believe we have data that would show it. If we could get the fortitude to do such, we will see we will see not just a, a group of our students in Georgia performing very well or, or highly performing, we will see the majority of our students performing very well. And I believe if we want to be a competitive state and nation, we've got to get to the point where all of our students and all groups are doing very well. Because as I often said, India and China, they've got enough people on their honor roll to to eclipse our entire population here in the United States. So it's important that we get all groups and all individuals competing and doing very well. Yeah, I, I appreciate that so much. Um, I, I saw one question in the chat and I, I'm gonna send it to you, Mary, with just like one, two minutes left and the equivalent of throwing a, a live hornet's nest at you. Someone asked, can we sue the state of Georgia for not providing a, an adequate public education? And I know that your shop has done some work around litigation in other states. I, I'm not gonna put you on the hook for exactly what that would look like, but more along the lines of what does this look like in other states and what can Georgia do to avoid that? Mm, okay. Yeah, I am a sociologist who works with a lot of lawyers. So I am not a lawyer. But I have, uh, <laughs> I certainly am familiar with some of the lawsuits that, that states have done and succeeded in. There's recent litigation in, in New Mexico and ongoing litigation places that is trying to, um, it depends on what the state constitution says is required in terms of um, what, what does the constitution of the state promise for, for students education. And if there's something there that is not being met by the state, then then that's where a lawsuit is possible. So I'm not familiar with what Georgia's situation is. And I'm also not a lawyer. So no, I, I appreciate that. Suffice it to say, um, the largest improvements that we've had in the state of Georgia to education funding have usually come in the response to lawsuits, but there is a very unique, to Dr. McKillop's point, a very unique way it has to go about, and uh, it can't be on equity uh, grounds. It has to be on adequacy grounds because of how the state constitution is written. So for all of our lawyer friends out there that might understand what that means, it, yeah, it is a very unique process. I, I know that I could talk to y'all for days, but we are uh, running short on time. Um, I, I wanna thank you both so much, Dr. McKillop, Dr. Beasley. If you don't know, you know now.